Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be presenting here today. So thanks to everyone at NextGen for giving me this opportunity. We're largely defined as individuals by patterns of neural activity in our brains. But how does the brain turn on? All brains first become active during development. However, the signals that guide this crucial event remain poorly understood. Today, I will show you how I have developed the fruit fly embryo as a system where I could directly dissect the mechanisms on the line the switch. All of us, particularly mothers, are familiar with the fact that the human nervous system becomes active before we directly interact with the world. I want to understand what triggers this activity and what this activity does during development. We do know that spontaneous activity experienced by developing brains is necessary for wiring of the nervous system. This is a movie of retinal waves, which are surges of neural activity that spread across networks in the retina before the eyes even open. Retinal waves shape visual pathways. Normally, neurons from the left and right eye segregate in our brains. With our retinal waves, desegregation fails. This is an example of how early activity shapes wiring of the nervous system. However, these waves begin around birth long after the brain turns on for the first time. To study the very moment when the nervous system becomes active, I needed to establish a new experimental system. I turned to the fruit fly, a system where I could monitor neural activity during the earliest stages of development. This is the life cycle of a fruit fly, and this is an embryo where neural activity begins. We express a calcium sensor in the embryo to monitor neural activity. This is an embryo around here is the body wall where the muscles and sensory neurons are located. In the middle is the nervous system, which, you, which will become act, active in a few seconds. Early on, you see movements, product of myogenic muscle twitching, similar to a fetus kicking. These movements originate within the muscles, independent of neural activity. You then see surges of spontaneous activity within the nervous system that generate neurogenic movements. This is when the CNS transitions from inactive to active. I'll refer to this period as pattern spontaneous network activity or PASNA. With this method, we can reliably record PASNA, not just of one embryo, but many embryos in parallel. As you'll see here, embryos survive, letting us capture spontaneous activity from the onset until hatching. Moving forward, this is gonna be a really powerful system as we can rapidly screen for genes and neurons involved in this process. The first thing that caught our attention was how stereotyped this process is. These are calcium traces from three individual embryos. This frame bump in activity is the very first episode of PASNA. When you align them by this episode, you see how the periodicity and intensity of this episode is very similar across embryos. Quantitatively, comparing developmental timing of PASNA across embryos shows remarkable stereotypy. Moreover, we quantified the time interval between episodes and discover a stereotype accelerating trajectory over the first five episodes. We next zoom in into the first bottle of activity using volumetric two photon imaging. This reveals a characteristic spatial structure. Before onset, there is sporadic flickering like activity throughout the CNS. Then activity begins at a localized initiation site and propagate along the anterior posterior site. Then it reaches its peak activity. Remarkably, this wave of activity always initiates in the anterior site and ends in the most posterior site, revealing spatial stereotypy. We next ask, how does this process start? To do this, we wanted to find what neurons become active first. Based on data that I don't have time to share, we know that the transition from flickering to PASNA depends on neuron-to-neuron -neuron chemical communication. 
We reasoned that by blocking this communication, we could trap embryos at the flickering stage, thereby revealing the neurons that are selectively active before PASNA. Excitingly, we saw a specific subset of cells label. This include a handful of neurons within the CNS and a few neurons here in the periphery indicating that they're sensory neurons. When we zoom into these neurons, we found that their morphology is characteristic of mechanosensory chordal tunnel neurons, as you can see in this example and in this schematic. We then wanted to examine the potential role of the sensory neurons in shaping PASNA initiation. For this, we specifically inhibit them. Our prediction was that we would see a decrease in PASNA, but to our surprise, PASNA was intensified in embryos lacking mechanosensory input. When we quantified the proportion of episodes over developmental time, we saw that these embryos experienced more episodes earlier, as shown by this leftward shift. In data that I'm not showing, we also saw that episodes of activity were stronger. If this is true, the mechanosensory inputs acts in dampening PASNA, one will predict that blocking the upstream muscle contraction will have the same effect. This is exactly what we observed. Inhibition of muscle contractions causes a shift to the left, indicating that episodes are happening earlier. Thus, mechanosensory neurons are relaying information about muscle twitches to the CNS and then negatively modulating PASNA. We then ask, what is the behavioral consequence of perturbing the sensory to CNS interaction during development? To test this, we use in an inhibitory optogenetic tool that allows transient inhibition with the use of light. We inhibit mechanosensory neurons for five hours, which covers the period of muscle twitching and PASNA. We then let the embryos hatch, and 24 hours later, we examine larval behavior. We look at foraging, which is what fruit fly larvae use their brain for most of their time. We record the behavior of many larvae and then use a computational tool developed by a fellow postdoc in the lab. This tool converts high dimensional data into a 2D space that captures the core components of foraging, namely crawling, pausing, and bending to sample the environment or change direction. To use this method, you embed control and experimental animals in the same space, and then ask how these groups differ. When we compare the relative amount of time that each of these groups spend on different parts of the space, we notice that the transient inhibition group spends more time crawling, as shown by the dominance of green in this region, and less time pausing, as shown by the dominance of purple in this region. This suggests that altering the pattern of PASNA leads to a simplified foraging behavior, skewing it towards more crawling. Overall, my work shows that spontaneous activity is stereotyped, thus genetically programmed. This actually challenges how most people think about activity-dependent mechanisms of circuit wiring. Sensory activity during myogenic phase dampens initiation of spontaneous activity revealing a previously unappreciated sensory to CNS signaling during the early stages of circuit formation. Lastly, I showed you that modifying spontaneous activity during development leads to behavioral changes, which suggests a form of innate motor learning. This work lays the foundation for many interesting questions that I plan to pursue in my own laboratory. For example, what are the neural initiators of spontaneous activity and how do they turn on? I'm in the process of acquiring genetic access to a candidate set of initiator neurons. I will then use the deep knowledge of neural development in the fruit fly to find out where these neurons come from. I will also use an electron microscope to determine the circuitry of these initiator neurons at the single synapse resolution level. And I will use genetics to understand how these initiators turn on 
I'm also interested in understanding how spontaneous activity shapes the circuits that underpin behavior. I plan to perform targeted manipulation of spontaneous activity and then examine how larval circuitry is affected. Lastly, I will correlate changes in the patterns of spontaneous activity with changes in behavior using a panel of mutants and drosophila species that exhibit differences in foraging. Answering these questions will provide a model for how the nervous system turns on and will decode how activity during circuit formation shapes the nervous system. I would like to thank Tom and Chris for their exceptional mentoring. Also a special thanks to Minson and Ryan for their crucial work in this project. And thanks all of you for your attention.